It doesn't look like a flying machine. Mike Collins said it looked like a praying mantis. All the rules for flying on Earth went out the window because on the moon, there's no air, no need for streamlining. This is a model of a limb. It took eight years to build and cost four billion of today's dollars. The orange-colored mylar shows how dangerous the mission was because that plastic is insulation. When they landed on the moon, the astronauts were just some five feet above that engine. It was spewing gases at 5,000 degrees centigrade. But the biggest problem was weight. The vehicle had to be strong but light. Technicians were rewarded with bonuses of up to $25,000 for every pound they could take off of it. The walls were just thick enough to hold the molecules of air the astronauts breathed as thin as heavy aluminum foil. This gold helmet has become the symbol for the moon mission. The gold wash was to protect the eyes of the astronauts. Unless their faces were shielded from the rays of the sun up there, they ran the risk of going blind. Everybody's seen these space suits. The ones that went to the moon were about as special as anything ever tailored. They had 500 parts to them. They weighed 183 pounds. There were four layers to each of them, and they had two missions. One was to be a life support system to surround the astronauts with the oxygen of Mother Earth. These were also suits of armor. In space, you're always in danger of being struck by tiny objects, small meteorites. They might be extremely small. But on the moon's surface, they'd be coming in at 64,000 miles an hour. You might think that the people who made the helmet and the moon suit would have to be great specialized technicians. The fact is, ordinary Americans made them. I uh, made boxing gloves before I came here. And the fact is, I was an experienced sewer, but I had to learn all over again because uh, it was completely different from what I had sewed before. This was getting right down to a 64th of an inch, and where I had sewed before, you just sewed on a production line. And this here is uh, quality more than quantity. Well, when they're up there in space, you know what parts you've worked on, and you just say, well, I hope that part don't fail because I'd feel it was my fault if it did. My sentiment is what Hazel said. Well, I was just wondering if my pair of gloves was what he had on. Uh, if you make a mistake, that, if you don't admit it, you have to think about the astronaut, too. If you make a, uh, like a needle hole in flat or something like that, well, if you don't admit that, that would be on your conscience all the time, seems to me. Because I remember Armstrong and all them used to come in, and uh, they would look around and see what we were doing. And once in a while they talked to us, and sign their all uh, we'd get them to sign their autograph some of them were real comical <laughs> we got a kick out of them we all want to talk to them again <laughs> i mean when i'm going down the aisle everybody looked at them looked at them afraid to talk i said hi buddy <laughs> <laughs> oh i'd love to go into space i think it would be really thrilling just to get in there and just blast off <laughs> i'd love to go to space and just live there Every day you get up, you come to work, you go home, you clean house. If we go out there, there's no house, no kids, no clothes. <laughs> I like to ride in an airplane, and I think I'd like to go in space. And I'd like to wear our own suit that we make. I think I could depend on it. After each wearing, the technician tailors need four days to take the suits apart in a sterile room and put them back together. This is Apollo Control at 100 hours, 14 minutes. We're now less than two minutes from reacquiring the spacecraft on the 13th revolution. When next we hear from them, uh, the lunar module should be undocked from the command and service module. The flight director, Gene Kranz, is going around the control center now, talking to his flight controllers, reviewing status, and uh, in preparation for making the go no go decision. Apollo 11, Houston, we are go for undocking, over. Roger, understand. They're 40 miles above the moon. To keep from falling into the moon, they fire a rocket and enter lunar orbit. They circle 12 times while all systems are checked out. By this time, Armstrong and Aldrin have entered the lunar lander. On the 13th orbit, the lunar lander, Eagle, separates from the command module, Columbia, which circles the moon. Hello, 
Eagle, Houston. We're standing by, over. Roger, Eagle, sun dot. Roger, how does it look? The Eagle has wings. Roger. The lunar lander leaves the command module. Two men, Armstrong and Aldrin, leave Collins behind. This shot is taken from Collins' window. Now began a space ballet. That's Columbia, the mothership. Mike Collins is in it alone. I got a fine looking flying machine there. You go to space factory upside down. Somebody's upside down. In this duet, the Lem is presenting itself for Columbia's inspection. On the upper right of your picture, you see a ladder on the leg. It's from there they'll step onto the moon. The legs end in pods because nobody knows how soft the surface of the moon is and the pods will keep the lander from sinking too far. The bottom part of the limb is illuminated by the sun. It's that part which will remain on the moon. Now, as it turns, on the right, the darker part catches the sun. That's the section they'll ride back if all goes well. Here you go, one minute to take. You guys take care. You got right down US one, Mike. See you later. Aldrin and Armstrong have just said goodbye to Collins. Looking down on these craters is deceptive. These shots are from high up, and so it is difficult to realize that the sides of some of them are twice the height of the walls of the Grand Canyon. They're not yet at the point of no return. This is Apollo Control. We have less than 10 minutes now until loss of signal on the 13th revolution. Uh, during this uh, revolution, uh, we will be giving the uh, crew on the, lunar, on the lunar module a go, no go for the descent orbit insertion maneuver. They're upside down, falling towards the moon. The moon is below. It is alien, strange, forbidding. It looks lifeless, but we had come so far to see if there had ever been life here. All the evidence was that this was a dead satellite of the living Earth, but until we landed on the moon and looked for clues, we could not know for certain that it had never supported life. The moon always keeps the same side towards us, and that side is relatively flat. It's thought that when the Earth and moon were both more liquid, the pull of Earth's gravity may have caused tides that flattened the moon's surface. For a reason nobody knows, the far side of the moon is all hilly and mountainous. Until this century, nobody had ever seen the other side of the moon. That's where Eagle is going. That's where the decision will be made, to land or not to land. They'll make it out of radio contact. Apollo 11, this is Houston. All your systems are looking good going around the corner. We'll see you on the other side, over. Right. Everything looks okay up here. Roger out. On the far side of the moon, where no human eye could see them and no human ear could hear them, Armstrong and Aldrin would decide whether they could land on the lunar surface that Sunday in 1969. And as the moon sinks slowly in the west, Apollo 11 bids good day to you. Roger out. And we've had loss of signal as Apollo 11 goes behind the moon. This is what Mike Collins saw going around the moon just before Armstrong and Aldrin landed. That's an Earth rise. That's us back there behind the lunar horizon. That's the world we live in. The moon is lit with Earthlight, that blue line stretching across the great plains of the moon. Space was the frontier of this century. 
But the century before, the frontier had been the West. The old frontier had never disappeared completely. Cattle drives, open ranges,